Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's presentation, The State of Voting, Expanding Access and Addressing Barriers. I'm sure many of us have heard the news of legislation across the nation that is being proposed to change the way people in our country are able to access ballot boxes. I wanted to be able to address this issue with the community by inviting two panelists to join us tonight. We are lucky enough tonight to be able to hear from Jessica Jones Capral and Evan Horowitz. Jessica Jones Capral is the Policy and Legislative Affairs Senior Manager at the League of Women Voters United States, where she works to deliver the League's message around federal advocacy priorities through lobbying and the development of advocacy strategies. Jessica is an expert on League policy positions and works to implement grassroots strategies in coordination with League members and organizational partners around the country. When not working to defend democracy and empower voters, she can be found in Washington, D.C. with her husband, their five-month-old son, and their dog, Lily. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are also joined tonight by Evan Horowitz, the Executive Director of the Center for State Policy Analysis at Tisch College, Tufts, a research organization that analyzes live policy issues in Massachusetts. He has been the quick study columnist and resident data journalist for the Boston Globe. He also wrote for 538, NBC's Think, and the Washington Post, and briefly served as a fill-in host for WBUR's Radio Boston. In the bygone past, Evan was a professor of English literature with stints at Stanford, Harvard, Brandeis, Princeton, and the University of North Texas. He also attended the Cordon Bleu, where he learned a set of French cooking techniques that he now uses to keep his family happy at dinner time. Thank you, Evan, so much for joining us tonight. Before we move on, I would like to, Evan will turn on his camera when it's his turn to present. Thank you for asking. Um, I want to thank our sponsors for tonight's event, the League of Women Voters Arlington for helping us get the word out about this program and the Arlington Libraries Foundation for supporting civics education programming for the community. I also want everyone to know that this program is being recorded tonight and will be aired on ACMI as well as on the library's webpage, you'll be able to find it there. Thank you so much and uh, just wanna let everyone know with this, Evening is pre being presented as a panel. We're going to hear from Jessica first, then we're going to hear from Evan, and then we're going to open up the room for questions. Uh, you are welcome to enter questions either in the chat or in the Q&A feature, and I will address those questions at the end of the session. We'll save them for then. So without further ado, I want to turn the floor over to you, Jessica. I'm really looking forward to learning more about the national situation of this national state of voting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, and I'm so happy to be here with you all um, for this event. Um, I, as Anna said, I do work with the League of Women Voters in the national office in Washington, DC. Um, every day the League works to empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, uh, and voter service activities. Through our leagues in all 50 states and in DC and in over 700 communities across the country, we protect and educate millions of people every election cycle to ensure that they can participate at the ballot box. The League played a major role in the 2020 elections, protecting voters and providing them with the information they needed to vote. Through our um, election website, vote411.org, the League reached over 6 million voters wanting information like, where do I vote? What do I bring with me? How do I register to vote? And more. We also protected more than 25 million voters through our election related litigation to expand absentee excuses, waive witness requirements, and establish or enhance notice and cure processes for ballots flagged for rejection. In 2020, the League also or made history and celebrated um, two significant milestones. First, the 100th anniversary um, since our founding in February, and then the 100th anniversary um, since the ratification of the 19th Amendment. I think in order to understand the current voting rights landscape, we first have to look back at the last election. The 2020 election cycle was unlike anything we have seen before. It was a generation defining um, public health crisis that affected nearly every voter, causing dramatic shifts in the way that Americans could safely exercise their right to vote. An unprecedented strain was placed on local governments, elections officials, and community groups working to engage and empower voters with while widespread myths and disinformation 
efforts threatened to discourage voter participation. Some officials use their power, positions of power to limit, not expand, voters' access, leading to voter suppression in multiple states. Slowdowns and service limitations of the U.S. Postal Service also cause ballot delivery delays to voters and then back to elections offices. States modified elections requirements and rules for casting absentee ballots. And Congress failed to pass legislation that would provide billions of dollars of funding to local elections officials so that they could properly respond to the changes necessary to keep poll workers, elections officials, and voters safe on election day. Now, those were the problems, but despite the constant challenges to voter registration and voting, the 2020 election actually had the highest voter turnout of the 20th century. In fact, per the US Census Bureau, 17 million more people voted in the 2020 election than in the last presidential election in 2016. Hispanic, Black, and Asian voters turned out at higher levels. Voting rates were higher in 2020 in 20, than in 2016 across all age groups. More women turned out than men, and they also turned out at a higher rate than in 2016. The 2020 election showed us how resilient voters were and how excited and motivated they were to participate in casting their ballots. The 2020 legislative cycle uh, shows us how motivated legislators are now to ensure that the people who did participate, those people who made history by showing up to exercise their right to vote, don't get to do so again. This 2020 backlash is in response to false accusations about voter fraud and election irregularities, and they are rooted in racism. This year alone, we've seen around 400 anti-voter bills in 47 states introduced by state legislators. Some have even been signed by governors and enacted into law. Nearly half of the restrictive voting bills take aim at absentee voting, a practice that was heavily used in 2020 in response to the ongoing pandemic. Access to absentee or mail-in ballots has always been traditionally used by older Americans who either because of age or health have voted from the safety of their own homes for elections for decades. With the expansion of absentee and mail ballots extending beyond those traditional voters to communities of color, we're seeing a retraction in those laws. Until the 2020 election, it was hard to determine what the partisan split was and which party used mail-in um, voting more. Attempts to restrict or limit access to absentee and mail-in ballots are an attempt to shrink the electorate and limit access to the ballot box. For the, for the most part, these laws have come in in the form of limiting applications for absentee ballots. Legislation in Georgia, Iowa, and Florida have even gone as far to prohibit local elections officials from sending ballot applications to all voters, a practice that was regular in the 2020 election. And in Arizona, where they have the permanent early voter list, lawmakers enacted changes that could remove thousands of voters who automatically receive a ballot for every election in which they are eligible to vote. States have also moved in 2020 to enact stricter photo ID requirements. Proponents of voter ID laws claim that voting with an ID will tamp down on voter fraud, but there are very few instances of voter fraud actually occurring across the country, if any. There's a higher chance of actually being struck by lightning than of finding someone who is impersonating someone else at the poll booth. Voter ID laws disproportionately impact communities of color, younger voters, especially students, and older voters who lack driver's license or the identifying paperwork that needed um, required and required uh, in a voter ID law. These laws also suppress turnout by purposely preventing people from turning up to the polls or preventing others from showing up in the first place. Following the 2020 election, laws in Arizona and Georgia <clears throat> were applied to early voting and absentee voting, requiring voters to send in copies of their ID with their request form. In a digital age that we have all become so accustomed to, this would prevent even someone as tech savvy as myself from requesting a ballot to vote from home. Additional restrictive legislation um, purges which or cancels the registration of voters from the voting rolls if they don't vote 
It also, they also roll back laws that allow voters to register to vote on election day, um, often called same day registration. Um, and these laws threaten the ability of groups like the League of Women Voters um, to register voters at events, in public spaces, or with local registrars. And finally, um, additional laws roll back automatic voter registration systems, which are meant to simply enroll someone to vote. And while there have been nearly 400 of these pieces of restrictive legislation that have been introduced, very few have actually been signed into law. So some good news. Legislation has been passed and signed by governors in Georgia, in Florida, in Iowa, Arizona, and Arkansas. And there are other states where it's trying to move before legislative sessions end. Now for some more good news, because <laughs> it's not all bad. In fact, twice as many bills to expand voting have been introduced as those that have been introduced to limit voting. And nine of those bills have been signed into law. So um, more expanding, expanded voting laws have been enacted than restrictive. And I don't wanna dip into the work that Evan will talk about, but one of those expansive voting bills was passed here in Massachusetts. States leading the way with the greatest number of expansive voting bills include New York, Maryland, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. Bills in six states would extend or create no, ex no excuse absentee voting, making reforms in these states that were enacted during the COVID-19 pandemic permanent. Bills in 11 states would require that voters be notified of and given an opportunity to, to cure absentee ballot defects, in some cases, even after election day. Bills in seven states would create or expand access to permanent absentee voting lists, like the one I mentioned in Arizona previously. Um, and voters on these lists would automatically receive an absentee ballot for every election without having to reapply uh, for every, at every election. Bills in 15 states um, would expand voter registration opportunities, including by offering online voter registration, um, and providing same day or um, an election day registration, providing for pre-registration of 16 year olds and extending voter registration deadlines. And finally, establishing and expanding automatic voter registration. Bills in five states would establish automatic voter registration. And then bills in three states would establish or expand election day or same day registration. So some bills in 15 states are an omnibus bill with multiple provisions. And then there are some bills in some states that are just a single provisions. Um, and, ten, and 10 states have seen movement on bills to restore voting rights to people with past convictions. Um, and one of those bills was actually signed um, in Washington. The expansive voting bills offer a better access to those with disabilities by designating someone to assist them in marking their ballots. And still others extend no excuse absentee voting or create early in-person voting, allowing voters to cast their ballots prior to election day in a designated early voting site. And other new laws expand automatic voter registration agencies so that more people have the opportunity to become registered. So it's not just all about legislation in the states either. <laughs> Congress um, has actually introduced a once in a generation bill called the For the People Act. Um, the number is HR1 and S1 um, in the respective chambers. Uh, the For the People Act uh, focuses on four overarching areas of democracy reform. Um, that will include expanding voter access and participation, ending the dominance of big money in politics, establishing independent redistricting commissions in every state, and uh, enacting ethical standards and accountability for all branches of government. This historic piece of legislation um, passed the House earlier this spring, um, and it's actually been heard in committee in the Senate, um, and the Rules Committee went through a markup earlier uh, this month. We expect there to be floor action around this legislation in the Senate in the very near future. The For the People Act also addresses anti-voter legislation um, by creating national standards for voting. Um, that For the People Act will promote voter access by expanding early voting availability 
it'll require that voters not have to wait in lines longer than 30 minutes to vote. And it'll create universal automatic voter registration systems, and it'll require same day registration. It'll also place limits on how states can purge voter rolls, enact campaign finance laws, like establishing a small dollar donor programs, um, and in partisan gerrymandering by creating independent redistricting commissions in every state. The creation of these national standards for federal elections would thwart virtually all state level anti-voter bills. Another piece of legislation that, I want, that hasn't been introduced yet, but I think is very, is very important and very close to my heart is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act will restore the Voting Rights Act um, after the 2013 Shelby v. Holder decision um, and ensure that every voter, regardless of where they live, what they look like, or what language they speak, has equal access to the ballot box and is protected from unfair laws and practices that make it more difficult to vote. And it'll do this by establishing a new preclearance formula um, that looks at past voting rights laws in history um, passed by legislat legislatures or um, local election officials um, and um, bring states under a preclearance umbrella so that the, any, any laws uh, have to be pre-cleared by the Department of Justice before they go into effect. Um, and this will help cut down <clears throat> on laws that are meant to discriminate, um, meant to discriminate against um, Black and Hispanic um, voters um, and those uh, with other disabilities. It'll also redefine what a voting rights act, voting rights violation is. Um, so it, it, it really addresses the Shelby B. B. Holder decision where the Supreme Court said that it wasn't um, taking into account new um, information um, and was taking, uh, it was using an old outdated formula. And it'll establish a national notification system, ensuring that if any law goes into effect, that voters have to know about what, what, what the law is, how it affects them, um, and how it affects um, where they go to vote. Unlike the For the People Act, um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act um, cannot reverse state bills. Um, it actually will respond to future laws by restoring the preclearance for changes, protecting and empowering voters, and um, responding to the 2013 Supreme Court decision in Shelby County versus Holder that eviscerated key provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The passage of these two laws go hand in hand. We cannot trade one for the other, as has been recently suggested by a few senators. If we want to honor, honor the life of Congressman John Lewis, we must pass both of them. Um, there's about 300 pages of legislation within the For the People Act that's called the Voter Empowerment Act. Um, and that was a key piece of legislation that Congressman Lewis um, wrote when he um, uh, for, wrote and uh, advocated for for several years. Um, so we must pass both of them if we want to continue to honor his legacy. Um, the VRAA, um, like I said, it hasn't been introduced yet. The VRAA is the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, and that it hasn't been in, uh, introduced yet because uh, Congress is working to us to collect evidence um, that would pr protect it uh, in the future um, and would as help us continue to establish the need um, for the Voting Rights Act and gather evidence in states across the country of, um, <clears throat> of bad laws uh, so that we can establish a need for the legislation. Uh, we wanna keep all these bills together and keep them moving forward. Um, and the League of Women Voters has an action alert on our website and we'd encourage you to contact um, your senators as this bill moves forward. Um, even if you think that your senators are supportive of it or they have already signed on as co-sponsors and I can tell you that both of yours have, it's very important to continue to um, support them um, in, in their co-sponsorship of this legislation. We wanna make sure that folks uh, hearing, are hearing from their constituents about what, about why they should continue to support it um, so that they can um, feel happy um, and justified in their decision to continue um, working on this bill moving forward. 
And finally, um, it's not exactly voting rights related, um, but there's a, another lead piece of legislation connected to DC statehood. Um, DC state it, establishing DC statehood um, would ensure that democracy is applied to everyone across the country. Um, for the 700,000 people in DC, we do not have voting rights in Congress. Um, we have a representative uh, who uh, is allowed to run a committee and um, but she doesn't have a vote on the floor and we do not have senators. So if you could call your senators for me and let them know that uh, you support DC statehood, I would really appreciate it so that I would have full rights um, as an, of, an, of the full rights of an American citizen. Uh, finally, redistricting is starting soon. I know that many in the league um, are working on redistricting and fighting to ensure that there's fair representation all across um, communities um, for, for everyone. Um, so please make sure to pay attention as this process starts, um, both at the local and state levels and for your federal representatives. And with that, um, I'll take a break and hand it over to Evan. Thanks, Jessica. That, I mean, it's so interesting to hear about things going on around the country. I'm so focused on uh, events here in Massachusetts. So my, my name is Evan Horowitz. I run the Center for State Policy Analysis at Tisch College, uh, Tufts University. We do nonpartisan research on live legislative issues, uh, policy issues in Massachusetts, including ballot questions. So that's what I'm going to be focused on. Uh, election, voting access, voting rights, and the state of the contemporary debate here in Massachusetts. We tend to think of ourselves as a pretty progressive state. I mean, we have a supermajority democratic control in the legislature, um, we're, but as it turns out, we're far from the cutting edge when it comes to voting practices and outcomes. I'll start with two kind of basic measures there. So, uh, think of the share of eligible folks who are registered to vote and the share. Oh, I see that some people are noting that my camera isn't working. Um, it's on. So that's as much as I can do on my end, I think. Um, but anyone can feel free to jump in and uh, um, give me technical advice if that's useful. Uh, two core measures. So think of the total population of people who are eligible to vote, vote right, of adults. Uh, what share of them are registered to vote and what share actually vote. So Massachusetts is not at the top on, on either, oh, try turning it off and on is the message I'm seeing. So I have done this and I will do this again. This video off, video on. Someone wanna send a note if that made a difference? No. Uh, I could disconnect and reconnect. Sure, that's what I'm gonna to try to do. So I will pick up, I'm gonna leave and come back and I will try to pick up where I left off. Thank you everyone so much for bearing with us. Again, I'm looking so much forward to having programming back in the uh, community room in the Robbins at some point in the future. I, when we came on to test our uh, tech before the presentation, Evan's camera was working perfectly. So let's hope he can get that working again when he turns that back on again. Uh, again, thank you so much for bearing with us. This is a very, oh, great. Here we go. Thank Any you better? so much, Evan. Ah, well, this time I'm visible. So you can see my smiling face. Uh, and I guess I shouldn't repeat all the words I said because I'm hopefully I was audible before. Um, but I was talking about sort of two core measures for how we can think about how well Massachusetts is doing in terms of enabling um, access to uh, so one would be share of eligible folks who are registered, another would be share of eligible folks who actually vote. And we don't, we do okay, but not great on either measure. We're 27th among states in terms of registered voters as a percentage of all eligible voters. So that means 26 states have a higher share of eligible people who are actually registered. We do a little bit better than that in terms of the number who vote. And when it comes to minority voting, it's a, again, a kind of mixed picture. Uh, white residents are more likely to be registered and more likely to vote than any other group. Um, we do 
relatively well, so top five among states in terms of the share of Hispanic residents who are registered, and that translates into a relatively high number of Hispanic residents who vote. But we do worse in terms of black voters who are registered uh, as a percent of voters and also black voters who vote. In fact, we're in the bottom um, sort of 10 states there. Uh, and like everyone else, we have the same basic kind of quasi dysfunctional turnout dynamics, which is to say older residents vote at higher rates, turnout for presidential elections dwarfs turnout for midterms, which dwarfs turnout for off cycle elections like Boston mayor or any primaries. And there are policy reasons for some of these things. Perhaps the best example is the lack of same day registration or election day registration, which uh, Jessica mentioned. This is one of the few innovations that has really been proven to boost turnout in elections. You don't have to register in advance. You show up on election day, you say, you know what, I forgot to register, but I really wanna vote. And there's a mechanism to allow you to vote and have your vote counted. Um, we don't do that. Uh, in Massachusetts, you have to register well in advance, um, despite years of advocacy in that direction. I still think the, the, perhaps the best way to understand the, the current policy dynamics around voting in Massachusetts is to look at the last 18 months, which saw two voting related policy battles. One about COVID and voting from home, the other about the ballot question for ranked choice voting. So I'm gonna take those one at a time, um, give some background, talk through the main issues in each case, which I hope will illuminate broader patterns. First, the COVID and voting from home. So when COVID hit, it quickly became clear that elections had to be rethought and very quickly, because while it's true that, that lockdown started in March and April of last year, there were going to be elections well before November. We had special elections, we had municipal elections, we had primaries all through the spring and summer. And with the world in lockdown, vote from home and voting by mail seemed the obvious choice, but there's a problem. The Massachusetts state constitution imposes strict limits on absentee ballots and vote by mail. It says that there are three ways, I'll come back to this because this is now a contested point, but at the time it didn't seem like a contested point, it seemed like a well-established one. Um, in any event, the, it says that there are three ways to qualify for an absentee ballot. One, to be out of town. Two, to have a disability that keeps you from voting at your polling place. Three, to have a religious belief that prevents you from voting at your polling place. And if you can't claim one of these three particular exemptions, you cannot get an absentee ballot. Right? It's not a law that's in the state constitution. So it's not enough to argue that voting for home boosts equity or is vital to an effective democracy you've got to change the constitution. Again, we'll come back to this because that's increasingly a contested position. So at the time, the legislature thought it over and decided to simply declare that COVID created a disability for all residents. Meaning everyone could claim an absentee ballot under that second excuse, um, having a disability that made it impossible to reach the polls. So everyone was de facto eligible to vote absentee and that worked for last year. I, mean, I assume many of you voted absentee. There was a huge increase in the number of people who voted or vote by, voted by mail. Um, but notice it's not a permanent solution. It depends on the viability of this um, sort of de facto creation, de facto declaration that everyone has a disability due to COVID. It wasn't incredibly popular, but it's not clear it will be even available in 2022. Now, people are working on this. Uh, advocates are pushing on two fronts. First, in a bill generally referred to as the, as the Votes Act, which is principally dedicated to keeping the COVID era rules in place. Um, a big part of that is vote by mail and the provision I just talked about, um, continuing viability of vote by mail, continuing acceptability of vote by mail for those who don't have one of the three listed excuses. Um, but there's also more early voting, uh, easier registration, um, process for mailing everyone application, a number of other changes that were implemented last year uh, that enhanced access to the voting booth, stuff like that. But you can see the problem right away. If the constitution dictates three acceptable excuses for absentee voting, what's the excuse going to be in future once uh, COVID fades uh, as a kind of primary excuse? So this is the second front right now, which is building a legal case that the old understanding of the constitution is wrong that the idea that there are only three acceptable excuses is a misreading of the constitution. And that in fact, a broader vote by mail permission is possible. Um, as this is not a settled issue. This is probably going to end up being litigated, um, but it's a growing legal theory. 
So that, this is one part of it. Then there's the Secretary of State. I'll, I'll refer to him as the Secretary of State, though I think technically he's the Secretary of the Commonwealth, uh, who has been um, surreptitiously, let's say, expanding absentee voting for some time, despite the constitutional provision. And I should be clear, this not meant as a critique, it's just an explanation. So we have this, uh, this, this parallel system of absentee vote, voting in Massachusetts that's called early vote by mail. And it came into existence in a very strange way, um, which has led to some benefits, but also some trouble. When Massachusetts first introduced early voting, so this goes back seven or eight years, the secretary realized that it created an opportunity for a kind of quasi absentee. So even if you can't get an absentee ballot for the regular election, unless you have one of those excuses, maybe you could get an absentee ballot for the early election. And then the excuse list didn't apply. Anybody could get an absentee ballot for the early election. But of course, the early election is really the same as the main election, so it doesn't matter. So for any election in which there was early voting, you could get a no excuse absentee ballot. And some people did. It's called early no excuse vote or early vote by mail. Now, the trouble with this is, well, you can see it's kind of a hack and kind of a workaround. Um, it's never been challenged, so it hasn't been affirmed by the courts as constitutionally acceptable. And it's hard to publicize because too much publicity could invite a challenge. So that is ongoing. And it's not clear whether we'll keep two parallel systems or eliminate one of these. So those are some of the legal and theoretical issues around vote by mail. But let's get back to last year. So once we decided to allow vote by mail, uh, remember by, by saying that basically everyone in the state had the right to vote by mail by dint of a disability excuse from COVID. The next question was, how are we gonna do this? Because as a state, we're not really set up to process millions of vote by mail applications and ballots. And here we cut up against the second unique challenge of the Massachusetts voting system. It's town by town. In most places, most states around the country, voting is handled at the county level, right? It's counties who organize elections and handle ballot printing, things like that. We don't have county governance in Massachusetts, or we have vestiges of county governance, but we don't have robust county governance. And they certainly don't handle election challenges. Individual cities and towns have to get ballots printed, handle applications. Remember, the ballots can vary town by town. And they have to handle applications. And that's totally infeasible in a year when you are trying to manage millions of remote ballots, vote by mail ballots. We needed a lot more centralization which in practice needed to be organized by the Secretary of State's office. But keep in mind that the Secretary of State is an elected official, not an appointed one. Right? We vote for the Secretary of State in Massachusetts. So the governor can't say, do this. You're the, you know, run the election this way. Uh, I, you know, as the governor, I, I think we have to do it this way. The Secretary has his own um, purview and has strong feelings about how to handle remote balloting, which resulted in a second fight over whether to send ballots to all eligible residents. Right? You think of it this way. Once the state said, you know what? Everybody can vote from home. Everybody has that right this year because COVID creates this universal disability exception. Well, does that mean everybody has to go and apply to vote or how do they get a ballot? So one possibility would be, well, you just, you know, we just get the ballots and we send everybody a ballot. Send everybody a ballot. To the, right to their house, right to their home. We have addresses uh, for the voting rolls and let them fill them out and send them in. And this, the, the secretary didn't like this idea. Of, he's not the only one. There are lots of people who are concerned that this created opportunities for fraud. You have a lot of ballots out in the wild. What was going to happen to these ballots? What if someone, you know, collected lot, hundreds of them and tried to submit them? You know, what if there was fraud? Or even if there wasn't fraud, what if someone used the avail wide availability of these real ballots to stage examples of fraud and therefore undermine the perceptions of the integrity of the election. So the alternative is to, instead of sending everyone a ballot, send everyone an application, right? You don't get a ballot. What you get is an application to apply for a ballot that you can fill out at home. And that's what we ended up doing. Um, and the nice thing about this also logistically is that while ballots are different town by town, city by city, so it would really be hard to kind of centrally print up millions of ballots and send them out, the applications are not that different. So it's a lot easier to centrally print up the applications and then send those out and then have those filter through the towns for specific ballots. 
And that's what happened. And it went pretty well from a logistical perspective. Um, things got printed, ballots got distributed, votes got counted without any major scandals. So there was a lawsuit um, by some Republican groups to challenge the legitimacy of the COVID related changes, um, but it's not being taken particularly seriously uh, thus far. Um, but the future of all this is totally up in the air in terms of voting rules that will reign when the pandemic is officially over. Again, because it's just not clear what the constitution will permit and what legislators will um, pursue. All right, so that was one of the voting related fights over the last year. The other was about ranked choice voting. So this was a proposed change to the way people vote in Massachusetts that appeared as a ballot question in 2020. You may remember it if you voted in 2020. Um, like most ballot questions, I should say, it was considered by the legislature first, but not passed. Um, that's typically how questions get to the ballot. First, you pursue it through the legislature. And if you fail, then you go to, directly to the people or you try to mount a ballot campaign. And in a, in a case like this, it really tells you something. I mean, one, one thing we know for sure about current legislators is that they do pretty well under the current rules. After all, they got elected. So they're not especially eager to change those rules. Um, which is which helps explain why it's difficult to get uh, voting rules altered through the legislature and why they occasionally end up on the ballot. Anyway, the way ranked choice works, the basic setup is you rank candidates. Instead of saying, I'm voting for this person and not that person, you can say, I like this person best and this person second best and this person third best and this person fourth best. And you can do that for every election, you know, the governor's election, the secretary of state's election, lieutenant governor, you can rank. And the proponents of this made credible arguments about a whole set of potential benefits around this approach. I mean, we have towns that, that do it already. Um, Cambridge does it for a number of elections. So this approach does a better job of aggregating people's real preferences. Um, and in particular, it blunts strategic voting. So a lot of people feel when they go in to vote, that maybe they have a preferred candidate, but they're afraid that candidate won't get a lot of votes. So they'll be vote, they'll be throwing their vote away if they vote for that particular candidate, right? I think a lot of people have felt this. I really feel drawn to this person, but I'm concerned that I'll be throwing my vote away if I vote for them and therefore I won't do that. Uh, with ranked choice, that doesn't come up. You just list that person first and you list someone you think is more viable second. And if it turns out that the person you list first really isn't viable, then your vote gets transferred. So it works beautifully that way. So your vote will continue to get transferred um, down the line until it ends up with, attached to a viable candidate. All right, so there's one advantage. Another is that ranked choice creates sort of clearer winners in large pools. And we had a congressional primary in 2020 where the winner got 22% of the vote. That is a very small percentage of the vote, right? It's possible that maybe 25% of the people in the district actually liked that person, but they really liked him. Whereas the rest of the candidates were preferred by a huge majority of people, but they split the vote. And this happens in, you know, in first past the post elections like that one, where the person with the most votes wins, even if they get 8% or 12% or 22% or whatever it is. Uh, the final sort of advantage to talk about is it, it makes candidates more civil, but there are risks too associated with ranked choice, including the added complexity and possible problems with the state constitution. Anyway, I don't, I don't wanna talk for too long about the merits because it didn't pass and it's not, gonna happen at least the way that um, champions of that ballot measure hoped. Again, the Secretary of State played a role here as the chief organizer of election logistics. He emphasized um, during the run-up to the, to the ballot that this change to rank choice would require a whole lot of logistical changes, including new machines and centralized counting, which means shipping ballots around. And you think about this, one thing in a state like ours, where I was talking about, we have so much of our election infrastructure handled at the city or town level, where even the counts happen at the precinct level. So you're in a precinct, the end of the day, you tally up your votes, you count the numbers, and then you send the numbers along to, well, either centrally or up, up the chain to your town. With ranked choice, you can't do that. You have to get all the ballots together in one place or at least all the information on those ballots together in one place. So you can go through this counting, this multi-level counting process. And that's logistically more complicated. But the bigger issue, and this is what I really, this is the reason I'm really telling this part of the story, uh, turned out to be unexpected partisan pushback. So 
there's nothing inherently partisan about ranked choice voting. It doesn't obviously benefit one party. It's not pro-Democrat or pro-Republican, um, at least in any sort of clear and obvious way. And yet opposition to the ballot question split almost entirely along partisan lines. And the ultimate vote for ranked choice looked like the presidential vote. I mean, I'm not gonna show you the map, but the, if, you, if you look at a map of the results from that question, from question two, it was question two on the ballot last year, you'll see that the tally, the geographic layout of the tally looked very much like the, the standard Democratic Republican split around the state. Uh, more Republican areas voted against it, more Democrat areas voted for it, and more moderate areas broke against it, which is why it ultimately went down. That is weird though. Um, because it doesn't seem to be a partisan issue. And it's not inevitable either. The other ballot question, question one, which was right to repair, didn't look like that. The vote tally didn't have that geographic shape, right? It, we didn't turn into a partisan issue. So not everything turns into a partisan issue, but election related things seem to, right? Ranked choice voting, which is usually imagined as a, a wonky technocratic reform, got painted and understood as a progressive reform. And once that happened, it lost support from conservatives and from moderates. So let me see if I can sum up the takeaway from these two stories. So five points, five point takeaways. First, uh, the future of Massachusetts voting is totally up in the air in terms of whether people will be able to vote by mail. And that is both a political fight and a legal fight that is ongoing. Two, the Secretary of State has a lot of authority over election related policy in Massachusetts. Uh, three, the fact that Massachusetts elections are run by our 351 cities and towns makes it harder to coordinate and implement changes. Four, everything is partisan, even if it doesn't seem that way at first. Five, uh, finally I'll note this actually isn't a takeaway from the two stories, but it's something that I couldn't fit in otherwise and really wanted to say, which is that Massachusetts is sitting on a pot of about 40 million free federal dollars for election infrastructure upgrades, which we haven't used. And when I say haven't used, I don't mean like we haven't used in a couple of months, even though we've had access to it. I mean, haven't used in 20 years, even though we've had access to it. This was money that the state got access to in the early 2000s as part of the Help America Vote Act. And most every other state has already spent either all or the majority of their share Massachusetts has not. We have a huge amount of money which could be dedicated to meaningful um, election related infra infrastructure changes that could improve access. Um, and yeah, just to say it's sitting there waiting for the right plan. So I think I will stop there and um, I guess we'll go to questions. Yeah, we are gonna to go to some questions. And again, I invite you to enter questions either in the chat or the Q&A, either one will work for us fine. Um, before we start to see some questions from the audience, first of all, thank both of you so much. I definitely learned a lot. Um, my first question is kind of a question for both of you. I One of the things that I think that I really have seen a lot in the past few years is how different voting is in uh, both different towns in Massachusetts and across the country. And I'm interested to hear a little bit more about um, ways, and both of you addressed this a little bit, uh, Jessica, when you were talking about uh, standards in voting, national standards in voting. And Evan, you too kind of addressed this when you were talking about how different towns um, are voting is based in our towns. And I was wondering if you could kind of address that issue. How do we Aside from national legislation to bring standards, what do we do so that somebody in Georgia doesn't stand in the line that lasts for 10 hours? I live in a district, I live in Boston. I vote at a polling place that has very high turnout in Boston, where I do like to say Boston's favorite sport is actually not the Celtics, not the Red Sox, it's voting. Um, and yet we do, I've never stood in a line, never. <laughs> And I'm just wondering if what, what else can we do to support um, bringing more equity to voting across the country and the state? Jessica, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I mean, I think beside, aside from passing the For the People Act, there's there's not much uh, that we can do. And it's, it's actually really nutty that um, we have elections that are administered differently in, in so many ways. And, 
you know, that you can go to one township or one city to one county and have different election laws. Um, so really, I think if we want to have those things universalized, we really need bills like the For the People Act or um, the Voter Empowerment Act, things like um, the Automatic Voter Registration Act, which would establish automatic voter registration in every city and jurisdiction um, and state across the country. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, it's the job of Congress to uh, regulate uh, federal elections, um, and uh, they, that's the power that they have. And you know, if they lead the way um, on those things, then then it'll get done. But you know, on the flip side of that, we often see good voting laws and good voting expansion start at the local level and gain momentum across the country. Um, so it could be as some, you know, something outside of federal legislation. It could be as simple as, you know, getting your local election administrators to use automatic voter registration, to use same day registration, to expand um, absentee, um, and and hopefully those things will percolate up up to the uh, federal level and then become the law of the land eventually. So I'd say, you know, at the very kind of granular local level. There are good reasons to make sure, to give cities and towns a lot of authority to set rules and approaches over their own jurisdictions. They, they know their people, they, they have a good sense of their needs, they're very close to their communities. Um, and the, you know, the sort of general framework here in Massachusetts has been, well, the legislature sets basic standards that towns have to live up to, um, but they could go further with those standards and they could also, I mean, the, the key thing is to make sure everybody has, um, the, the money, essentially, this is really a money issue, to allow for ample access to voting, right? So sometimes it really is expensive to keep places open, have poll workers, whatever. So you, you have to make sure that the communities can afford it. And that really is a, a state responsibility more than a community responsibility. Um, the other thing is it helps to set consistent standards for the purposes of marketing, right? So one thing we did in the state when we set up early voting, this, as I said, this goes back seven or eight years, was we said, well, you have to be open at least this number of hours and at least this number of days for at least this period of time. And that's okay, but it's really hard then for the state to say, look, your polls will be open the Tuesday before at 4 p.m. because we don't know that. Every town is gonna make slightly different decisions. It's much better if you say, all polls have to be open at least these hours, exact hours, the exact days. Then you can say, then you can run information campaigns and say, wherever you are, you can go to your, you can go vote after work on this Tuesday because every town will have their voting booths open after work on this Tuesday, a week before election day. Um, so some standardization has to be considered in light of that and that it's very hard to get information to certain voters. I mean, they're, they're a huge class of low information voters that are really hard to reach, but whose votes count like everybody else's and you know who are, are Americans like everybody else and should be empowered uh, to get to the polls. And the easier you make it for those people, the better, and that includes getting consistent information. Great, thank you. We had a question from the audience about that 40 million that Evan mentioned. Who decides how that money gets spent? Why has it been sitting there for almost 20 years? And what kind of infrastructure can we hope to see? So um, it's an interesting story about why it's been sitting there for 20 years. Um, I think the, the important thing to realize is that the Secretary of State has a lot of discretion for requesting the use of, that, of those funds. So I think for a long time, there was a kind of deference to the Secretary of State, uh, various secretaries of state, um, to say, listen, we're waiting for the right plan for the use of this money. You oversee the election systems. You know what's needed. Let's put together a plan. And the promise has been, oh, a plan is forthcoming. Um, and, and then it sort of never happened or smaller plans happened. So there have been a number of smaller plans. We've made smaller draws on that money. Um, but the legislature has kind of deferred in that sense rather than pushing. Uh, and they could, I mean, the legislature could request that money um, directly. So, and, and there are ample opportunities. I mean, there are, there are some restrictions on what you can do with that money, but that they're wide. Uh, and this, the state has needs, um, both kind of physical needs in terms of machinery, um, but, but, but broader than that. And you know, the fact that every other state has found ways to use this money tells you, I think, that it can, the restrictions can't be so uh, austere. Um, 
And there was talk about using some of that money as part of ranked choice voting. And one of the challenges around the ballot initiative when ranked choice voting was being pushed through is that the logistical changes were gonna be non-trivial and expensive. It was gonna require new machines, it was gonna require new transport and new norms and things like that. And where was the money gonna come from? And the response was, well, why don't we use this pot of money? And that's probably what would have happened. But now that we're not gonna have ranked choice, at least not anytime soon, um, that money's still there. Uh, I was interested to hear, Jessica, I, I have heard so much, and I'm sure many people in the room too, have heard so much about those 400 anti-voter bills across the nation. And I, I have to admit, I did not know about the 800 uh, expansive voting bills across the nation. And I think many of us can, you know, obviously both of you have discussed what some of those provisions might include. Um, what is something on there that we might not expect on that list of new proposed legislation? And I think, to give you a moment to think, you know, when I heard <laughs> that, I was like, okay, so same day registration, um, uh, no voter ID, although that wouldn't be a law, no voter ID, although it might be in some places. Um, expanding access to uh, absentee ballots. Uh, is there anything else in there that we haven't thought of or that I, you know, like as somebody who's really a lay person in this area hasn't really less uh, obvious ways to expand access to voting? Yeah, I, so I think one of the things, I mean, just that I was, per, you know, when I was, I was doing research um, and brushing up on all the things going on across the country, one of the things that I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see were some disability provisions um, that the state of Virginia was actually um, putting into effect to help voters, um, you know, when you, when you are disabled and you cannot mark your own ballot, um, you have to, sig you can often signify or designate an agent someone to mark the ballot for you. Um, some states actually restrict that. Um, but so I thought it was interesting to see um, some of those provisions um, in Virginia and I think a couple of other states. And that's not something that, you know, I, I um, am affected by, but uh, it certainly is something that a large population of our country is. Um, so I think it's a great provision and something that we actually don't talk about a lot. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned when you mentioned it earlier, I was I was really struck by how important that can be for some people and yet I had never thought of it as being a way to expand access to voting. Yeah. Wow. Can I mention um, one here? Can yeah. I mention one here in Massachusetts? Yes, I would love to hear so, it. So, um I don't actually don't know if it's been refiled this session, but last session there was a an obligatory vote bill. That is a bill to make voting mandatory in Massachusetts. Really? Um and there are countries around the world where voting is mandatory. Um, it's not unheard of. Um, it does increase turnout, as you might expect. Uh, it's, it's an interesting approach. It has its advantages and disadvantages, but it, it's something that gets filed as a bill um, periodically. Mm -hmm. Wow. Hmm. Uh, another question from the audience. Given the tenor of the Senate, how many Senate votes are needed to pass that two, those two pieces of legislation? Well, we need 60 to get uh, through cl the cloture vote. Um, which is to allow it to, you know, come to the floor and then another 60 vote to um, uh, in debate. Um, I don't think that they'll go through the budget reconciliation process, which is a process that used, um, you only have 51 votes for that. Um, so those don't really apply, but uh, we need 60 votes. We have 50, 51 uh, right now, if it comes down to it, but um, there's going to be a lot of conversation about this bill in the coming weeks and the coming months um, and um, some tests, I think, to that filibuster uh, rule that the Senate uses um, so well or not so well, depending on what you want to <laughs> say. Wow. Um, looking to see if there are any other questions from the audience. Um, as we're waiting, just to see if there are last questions, I do want to point out, you did a little bit contradict yourself, Evan. It does seem that although you said that nothing is, that anything can be partisan, it seems that the right to repair may not be partisan. So, um, so yeah, anything voting related turns partisan. <laughs> I, guess, so. I think you uh, did add that. Um, and again, just one story I do need to share as we're kind of waiting for the last questions and finishing up tonight. 
I mentioned I do live in Boston and I was able to vote in Fenway Park and it was super fun. And I will always remember the experience of voting at Fenway. It was just, it was such a interesting way to live in 2020. In so many ways we were so locked down, but on the other hand, I also um, voted in the presidential primary at Fenway Park, which was a ton of fun. And I think it was something that a lot of Bostonians will always remember. I love hearing that. I feel like people don't share enough kind of heartwarming stories about the joys of uh, civic participation. Like I, I find voting really satisfying as an experience. I, I've sat on jury duty, uh, I've sat on juries now three times in my life. I, it's an amazing thing to participate, to, you know, to feel your citizenship at work, as it were. And voting allows you to do that. I, it's, it can be a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did have a note from a community member who I believe is also a town meeting member. Uh, point of information, Arlington Town Meeting approved ranked choice voting for local elections a couple of weeks ago. Has to go to legislator as a home rule petition, which is another, you know, it's a, again, the kind of, not so much the clash between towns and larger entities, but, you know, we do have to figure out how to work together. Um, Another question about redistricting. Redistricting could be done by computer software. Is that in process? Oh, I wish that this uh, participant here had been at our fantastic event on redistricting with uh, um, the redistricting group from Tufts, which was just so interesting. What a great panel that was. Yeah, I don't know if either of you can speak well, to how- I'll say a few things like, if you weren't at that, the redistricting group from Tufts is not a bunch of political scientists. It's a bunch of mathematicians, <laughs> mathematicians. right? Uh, there's, they specialize in topology. It's an amazing group, but yeah, that whole world has shifted in the direction of kind of sophisticated statistical analysis and math. And I, the final lines, I mean, so the process in Massachusetts is different than in other states, um, but the redistricting process as, as it's unfolding here will involve a whole bunch of computer simulations that are then, that advocates will then look over and push for. Like there will be first the computer simulations and then the fight over the politics. And in some ways you can't, it'd be hard to get the politics out of it entirely, right? Because the, even the, whatever the computer spits out has political implications, has equity implications, and you really wanna think those through. Um, so you'll get some samples and then people will start lobbying and advocating. I'll also just say that I voted at a baseball stadium uh, in 2020 as well. But to the question, yes, there are a number of different computer systems that have been developed for um, redistricting purposes. One developed by the group at Tufts, and I'm happy to say that I got to go to a conference with um, that group a couple of summers ago, and just I'm really impressed by all the work that's happening um, there. But yes, there are a number of different um, softwares that you can use to draw districts, and legislatures are using different software so I would say if you're going to get involved in um, help doing that process, you know, it'd be a great idea to use the same um, system that your legislature is using. Um, so you can kind of compare maps and potentially they'll share them uh, on the platform as well and you can go in and play with them. Um, but yeah, there are, there are at least three that I can think of off the top of my head um, where people are using computers to draw maps. Yeah, I just entered, um, uh, I think it's the Metrics of Ge Geometry and Gerrymandering Group, and I just entered their um, URL into the chat, so people can take a look. They've got, it's just, the work that they do is so interesting. It was great to have them uh, come and speak to the community and the community room back in the old days when we used to do that. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for coming out tonight. I learned a lot. Um, I was so glad to be able to offer to the community both kind of a national and local perspective. We do think, we kind of think of ourselves in Massachusetts as being a little bit separate from so many issues because we are such a, we lean predominantly so far to the democratic side, but it was fantastic to have both of you speak to these issues. I wanna thank you so much. And again, I wanna thank our sponsors for supporting tonight's program, the League of Women Voters in Arlington and the Arlington Libraries Foundation. They too supported the um, Tufts group presentation. So always look out for the great groups that we're having here. Again, you can always find out more about the programs that are offered at the Arlington, uh, Arlington Public Libraries if you go to our website, robinslibrary.org. And uh, in case people did not see it, the news is now public. So I can share that the Robbins Library is scheduled to reopen fully with, our most, with all of our hours and most of our services on 
June 21st. So lots of work for us to do in the building before that happens, but we are so much looking forward to welcoming the community back to our building. Thank you both so much for tonight's presentation. And again, this presentation has been recorded and you'll, if you wanna refer your friends and family to it, you'll be able to find information on our website. Thank you so much. Good night.